Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Microsoft uh, London Reactor uh, session. Uh, today, uh, we'll be talking about our architecting for scale. And during my uh, 10 plus years in, in IT, um, I've been um, tasked to uh, treat um, highly scalable systems. Uh, one of them uh, was handling uh, dozens of millions of users per day. Uh, another one uh, very specific um, should uh, handle um, a growth in traffic uh, in uh, 1000x uh, within a 12 hours period uh, for a fund fundraising operation. And this talk is um, a collection of advices uh, and knowledge I wish I had at that time when I was uh, building my first uh, scalable system. My name is Christopher Manner. Um, I'm a startup cloud advocate at Microsoft. Um, and you can reach me uh, on uh, Twitter, uh, on GitHub. Uh, you have my alias on the screen. Um, and also, uh, please, please, uh, if you have any questions, send them uh, directly uh, within the Q&A window at the, at the right of the screen. Um, and I will, uh, I will pick, the, pick them up um, as long as I can um, during my uh, presentation or at the end, we will also have uh, some time to do a Q&A. So um, as an introduction, um, I wanted to uh, clarify uh, one thing, which is uh, what does scale means? Uh, because when you're in a startup environment, uh, scale can, can mean a, a bunch of different things. Uh, the first thing um, could be employee headcount. Um, I worked in a startup and within four years, uh, we went from uh, 40 employees to 4,000-ish employees. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty huge scale and, uh, and you have a ton of issues uh, scaling employee headcount. Um, at, at such a growth. Um, also, uh, for most of startups, uh, when we want to scale, we want to scale the product usage or the number of our users, which most of the times is directly related to um, uh, to more sales and, and more money to scale uh, to scale the company. But if you're scaling your team and you're scaling your product, um, you will be at some point uh, in a need to scale uh, the number of features you have or the breadth of uh, existing features. And when you're scaling also uh, usage and features, you will need to scale operations because maybe you will have uh, bigger customers who are more demanding about uh, service quality or about testing or about support, etc. So we need to scale um, a different part of the organization and, and operations uh, will be a critical um, team to scale. And last but not least, uh, for most of the startups, uh, you will need to scale uh, your sales and growth engines. Uh, so, you, so you will be able to uh, actually get more customer on board, etc. For this presentation, I will focus on mostly the technical parts. And these technical parts are uh, uh, needed because uh, you will scale the uh, product uh, usage of or number of users. I will touch a bit about features and operation, but it will be uh, uh, very, uh, very few things about this. So uh, this talk will be uh, mostly technical. Um, so uh, if you have any question or if something is not clear because you do not understand the technical concept, etc., please again um, add, add them to the to the uh, QA section. Um, another thing I didn't say in my introduction uh, and before uh, jumping on the agenda. Uh, you will have access to the slides uh, just after the recording. So you will see a bunch of slides uh, with some links. Uh, do not hurry to copy paste or, or take a picture of the screen. No worries, uh, you will have all the links uh, just after the presentation. Um, and so there is different type of scalings and there is another fact I wanted to introduce uh, uh, before uh, going into this subject is uh, not every startup we scale up the same way. And so you will encounter a different type of scaling issues um, depending on different criteria. For example, what kind of growth you will have. Uh, 
do we you will you double the number of uh, user or triple or, or have tenx or um, uh, a rocket scale and the other um, uh, criteria is or uh, access is over what period is not the same thing uh, if you need to scale to double the scale of your system uh, within a night or uh, within a month. Uh, choices you will have, options you will have will be different depending on what kind of growth you will have and over what period. So, uh, Arguing for scale is a it's a big topic. Uh, we can definitely spend uh, several days um, around this topic, and, and depending on the kind of application you're developing, uh, if you're developing a heavily backend application or web app or a B2B app or a user app, a B2C app, there is different things we can say about uh, architecting for scale. So in, in 40 minutes, um, because I want to have plenty of time for the Q&A, um, I wanted to focus on two things. Uh, the first thing is a set of main principles uh, you may want to um, try to grasp and to use in your own product. And the second part is uh, some uh, recipes um, with hopefully uh, you can use uh, maybe just after uh, this this presentation. So uh, let's jump right in into the uh, main principles. So the main principles I will introduce you today is uh, first know your enemies, then understand your uh, scale access, uh, relax time boundaries. And the last one, uh, limit your state. So I will go over into details uh, for uh, each of these uh, four uh, principles. So the so first one, know your enemies. And one of your enemy is over engineering. Uh, when you're in a, in a startup uh, environment, um, you can expect to have a high growth at some point. Um, I wish you uh, a high growth. Uh, however, uh, engineers, developers, and I am a developer myself, we tend when we are uh, in this environment to kind of over engineer. Uh, let's say you're uh, just building your uh, MVP, uh, minimum viable product, and the engineer is uh, starting to add a Kubernetes cluster and add a ton of servers, etc maybe is not a good option. Uh, it could be interesting uh, in a technical side. It could be an interesting project to work on, but it may not be uh, the right choice uh, at this time. So uh, one of the things you can do to uh, try to not over engineer uh, your project and still being able to scale uh, when you will need to scale is to uh, follow these three uh, rules. Uh, the first one is um, designing for uh, 20x cross. So when you're on a whiteboard or um, on a paper, try to design your system as if it will enter a 20x cross. Um, but you will not implement uh, for this. You will only implement things for 3x cross. Um, why this? Because when you're making a design decision, architecture decision, it could be very hard and very costly and take time to change them along the way. However, if you're making the right choices uh, right from the beginning, but only implementing part of them, you will basically have a have path already built, pre-built uh, for a later growth. And if you're not having this growth, that's okay because you didn't spend all the engineering time to actually design, implement, and deploy um, a solution for uh, 20, uh, 20x growth. And uh, roughly deploy for uh, 1.5x uh, growth. So, for example, if you design a system and you've made some calculations and you know, yes, my uh, database server need to be. Uh, I don't know, uh, 16 gigabyte of RAM with this uh, type of um, hard disk, etc. cetera, um, for 20x growth, do not deploy this costly uh, server at the beginning. Start with a smaller server and having a pass for um, growing the server later on. Um, the other enemy uh, you can have uh, is uh, limits. Um, and we can have, a bunch of different limits uh, on a project, and we are 
most of the time we are not aware of them uh, from the beginning. Uh, the first thing is your own limits. So as I said, uh, software design decisions uh, can induce some limits because uh, maybe at some point you need to refactor uh, some code uh, to be able to scale more and refactoring will take time. Um, you will also have team capacity uh, limitations. Uh, so if you uh, want to have a highly scalable system, but you don't have the team for it, uh, maybe the right call is to uh, not build uh, such a complicated system, but try to find ways, as I say, to build less, but have an option for the next step already pre-built. Uh, but there is other limits uh, people don't think about uh, too much, uh, in, and especially in the startup environment. Um, it's the underlying platform. Um, if you're using a hosted service or if you're using a, a cloud service like Azure, even Azure has its some some limits. And I will uh, give you some sample uh, on a, on a, one of my Microsoft projects where we eat uh, limits um, of of some Azure services and how we may overcome uh, that, them. Uh, so we need to know your limits, but maybe limits are also uh, software issue. Uh, maybe you're relying on an open source project and this open source project has some specific limits built in. Uh, so if you max out the number of servers, uh, maybe you will not be able to use uh, this service anymore or this service will be uh, slower um, than, than pre in previous setup. So we, you need to be aware of, uh, of any limits uh, that come up with any of your components, hardware, software, framework, etc. If you want to learn more about uh, what the cloud limits uh, are, um, you can uh, check out uh, later on this uh, this link uh, with uh, the scalability, scalability targets uh, for specific Azure service, uh, which is uh, indeed the limits of the servers. And I wanted to uh, uh, jump on on a quick real world example of how to understand these limits and uh, design for growth. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, so all these two um, dimension of the know your enemies principles, uh, basically in a, in a real world sample. And uh, I took this sample from the uh, office licensing team. So the office licensing team is uh, responsible for a service, but it's called by any office client application, Word, Excel, Outlook, etc. In a world on any platform, Windows, Mac, uh, Android, iOS, etc., uh, they have around uh, 240 million hits a day. Uh, so this service in itself is, is, is a pretty scalable service, and uh, this is how uh, they uh, sold all the activation data um, in in Azure, uh, but. The principle is uh, basically you can you can use this principle in other um, area if your if your project is not of Azure obviously. Uh, so the first stage is uh, they didn't use a, a traditional database uh, because uh, they know that they had to scale um, to uh, to very large number and and scaling such a database will be very very costly. Uh, so they they use a NoSQL storage. Um, in this case, uh, the table storage service from uh, the Azure uh, storage. So basically, this service allows you to um, store um, a documented um, uh, list of columns, values, um, and with a specific uh, thing, which is any record uh, in this store need to have a partition key and a row key. Um, and this partition key is really interesting. I would um, uh, go into more details about partition later on, uh, but the fact is partition keys allow the system to actually split the data on uh, different uh, storage, uh, so we can get a much, much larger scale. Uh, however, uh, so we have um, like uh, 18 tables, I think, uh, within their um, database, um, and they were eating the number of limits, of concurrent limits, uh, which is 20K requests per seconds um, on one storage account. So their next step uh, was quite easy to implement, is to actually separate all table into its own storage account. Uh, so with this simple change and almost no code has changed, the only thing 
um, thing you need to change within your code to do this is to change the uh, connection string uh, from the database uh, for each table, but all the code requesting and manipulating data is exactly the same. Uh, so the engineering cost was quite easy. Um, it, it was more deployment cost, uh, and again, no architectural changes because you are still storing data on the same storage van, uh, storage database type. Uh, so each table uh, going on to its own storage account, then you multiply by the number of tables, your uh, scale capability. And then they were about to hit this limit and they know it because they knew the limit of the underlying service, so they can have time to move to another system. Uh, and right now they move all the tables to uh, Cosmos DB, which is a, a database in Azure, uh, specially made for the cloud, was the same, um, was different APIs. So you can use Cosmos DB with uh, table storage API, but also SQL API, MongoDB API, Kremlin API, etc. Um, and by doing so, uh, they've been able to move to another uh, storage still using the same API. So again, uh, from the code, um, very few code modifications to be able to move this. Uh, but because they had a, a proper architecture in place from day one, having partition keys, um, having um, uh, a schema, etc., they've been able to move to different uh, growth stages uh, without having to uh, redo much of their software. Um, next uh, principle is uh, understand your uh, scale access. Uh, there is different ways to scale a system. Uh, most of the company I see, most of the project I see and startups, they um, most of the time start by uh, having a, a website, a web application, uh, maybe with a front end and a back end and a database. Uh, most of the startups uh, start by this simple architecture. Uh, and there is different ways to scale it. Um, so let me uh, show you different ways. Uh, you can uh, scale horizontally, uh, which is best way to scale if you can. Uh, so what, what do we mean by scaling horizontally is uh, basically adding um, um, different servers, uh, more servers, but each of these servers is doing basically the same thing. Uh, so, for example, for for your backend servers, uh, the idea is to uh, basically start with one backend service uh, server and then add add up uh, fewer server and route the traffic, route the work um, into these different servers. Um, but it could be complicated to to do it depending on your architecture and how you cut the project and how you handle the data, etc. Uh, but there is other way to scale. Uh, you can scale by function of service. I, I really like this one um, because it's quite easy to do it um, in an agile fashion. Uh, so, for example, an ID um, around this is uh, you have a website, a web app, which is quite complicated. Um, and one of the specific feature of this product is taking uh, too much memory or too much uh, resources. Uh, for example, you're generating uh, invoices at the end of the month. It's a lengthy process that uses a lot of database queries and a lot of CPU to process all this information and to come up with the uh, PDF of the invoice. But you can try to spot these different features within your product, and when you spot one of them, you will try to extract only this feature from the hosting to a specific uh, service. So you will scale differently different part of your applications. Uh, and most of the time, our application, there is features that are um, not really so used, but they still need to be part of the product, obviously. And other features that could have um, specific impact or um, at the beginning of the day, uh, for example, your service handling authentication will definitely uh, need to handle a lot of authentication at the beginning of the day. Uh, so you will separate this um, authentication module uh, from the rest of your application. Um, and another uh, way to scale if you, again, cannot scale horizontally uh, is uh, scaling by partitioning or by tenants. Uh, so scaling by partitioning is basically rerouting, trying to find a way 
uh, when a request a request hits your server or when a user is connecting to your application uh, to um, move it on a, on a different partitions and each partition contains all the data from a subset of users or a subset of uh, customers and tenants is uh, the notion of um, uh, and specifically in a b2b uh, scenario um, any of your um, customer company will get its own tenant or maybe the biggest uh, customers will get a dedicated tenant and all the other smallest um, uh, customers uh, will be on a shared uh, tenant. Uh, it's quite, it, it could be quite easy to implement a, um, a scaling my tenant because the only thing you need to do is to identify how to scale them um, and then you will actually deploy the same infrastructure for each of your uh, tenants. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to root them uh, when they connect. Uh, so it could be quite easy to uh, to actually implement uh, this thing. Um, it's not the best way to scale, uh, but again, definitely uh, uh, give you some head up uh, so you have time uh, to do any refactoring you may have to do uh, to uh, to scale horizontally. Uh, Relax time moderators, and this is one of my favorite uh, uh, principles. Um, and I, I had sample of us um, all around my career uh, when uh, when a bunch of different uh, customers were saying, "Hey, I need to have uh, this operation uh, done in less than uh, one second, or this this should be instant, or any user can all the users need to be connected at the same time and be able to purchase uh, something at the same time." Um, this is not really the case. In most of our softwares, uh, if we relax time boundaries, at least for a, a few seconds, like five or six seconds, uh, you can do a lot of different things uh, and you can scale much, much more than uh, if you need to do uh, everything synchronously. Um, so you need to strive for synchronous communications um, and I will show you an, a sample of this uh, in the next slide. Um, you need to think about the consistency level and specifically on the database. Uh, for example, if a customer is, um, let's say you're uh, creating a, an e-commerce website, um, obviously uh, some of the things will need to be uh, synchronous. Uh, like uh, you need to be sure that you're not selling a product that is out of stock. Uh, so all your inventory, uh, all the inventory part of your application should be synchronous. Um, but the fact is most of the website uh, didn't need to be synchronous. Like let people add a product uh, into their uh, cart uh, and only at checkout time, check if all the products are still in stock. By just doing this, uh, you will open up a bunch of different uh, technical solutions that will help you to uh, really scale better. Um, and the last thing is, and I, again, I will show you a sample of all of us uh, just in the next slide, uh, is uh, use uh, message bus and, and background workers. Um, what I witness is that uh, most of the time, uh, almost all operations are done on the back end of the website. While you can uh, push uh, some of the um, operation on a background worker, um, let's let's take a very trivial uh, example of that. Uh, when you upload a new picture on a on any um, social uh, social media website, um, maybe your picture is a uh, big because you took it with your uh, latest from smartphone, so it's a 25 uh, megapixel um, uh, picture, um, and the um, at, at the end, the uh, social network only need a um, 800 pixel by 800 pixels um, image. So you will really need to resize the image uh, if you're uh, building this social network. Uh, resizing the image is is not something you need to, de to do right on the spot. Um, if it takes one minute to resize the image, that's okay. Um, and if you do so, uh, you can uh, use messages and a background worker uh, to do these kind of things. So I will show you two uh, examples of this principle. Um, so the first one uh, is uh, uh, read on replicas. 
um, most of the database, most of the websites um, I see have um, some sort of SQL database uh, behind it. Um, I took here a sample with a MySQL database, but it could be a SQL Server, PostgreSQL, etc. And most of the time, uh, the web application is storing all the data into this uh, MySQL database. Um, and we know that uh, these kind of databases uh, are really hard to scale or are really uh, costly uh, to scale. So one of the simple things you can do is to actually use a real replica. Uh, so for example, if you're hosted in Azure, you can uh, set up with a, um, a bunch of clicks or a simple script, um, creating a new replica server. Um, and within your code, uh, you just need to um, uh, separate any reading to any writings. So any readings will eat the read replica and any writing, uh, we need the master database as a write table database. Um, by doing so, you will be able to add uh, different numbers of replicas, um, either within the same uh, region, uh, or if you have users all around the world, uh, you can add read replicas um, more closer to the users. So you will improve uh, the response time for the user, the quality of the website. Um, but you need to relax time bound areas because replication between two, data two databases, uh, two servers can take a few seconds. Uh, so you need to be able to do this, uh, to relax this time bound area to be able to use this solution. But if you're using this solution, you will be able to scale your database uh, much, much larger. But um, if you don't, um, if you can't use a uh, read replica, if you need to have anything into one single database. Um, another um, aspect, and I, I'm actually, I'm writing a, a retrospective of a, um, of a website. We have, a, so I'm based in France and we have a company in France, a grocery store that has launched an operation to um, a book um, um, some uh, facial masks. Uh, so they don't have a queue uh, to um, of people for buying uh, fashion masks, um, and they use where uh, they use a simple system, an open source website to do this. And this, but this open source website is only using uh, one database, um, and we had I think millions of users because it was ad advertised on on national TV. Um, so. Um, the day they open last week, the day they open uh, the settings, the bookings, um, the website was almost um, um, down for one hour. Um, and I looked at the website and how it was created, etc. And everything was stored in the database. Uh, but the fact is, um, we could have come up with another uh, way of doing this. Uh, and maybe we could have used uh, the uh, background write. Um, um, architecture. So basically is most of the time, as I say, you have a website and a database at the back end. What you can do is uh, we know that scaling the database is complicated. The number of concurrent connection on any single database could be limited to 10 or hundreds. Um, and it's much, much more complicated to go beyond that number. Um, however, we have services, and especially we, if you are hosted on a cloud provider like uh, Azure, uh, we have services that can handle uh, hundreds of thousands connections uh, per second. So uh, one of the ways you're doing this, because uh, the idea of this uh, form they had is uh, simply register your intent uh, to uh, to buy masks, so you are not committing any uh, buying. You will pay in the store. Um, so what they could have done is uh, basically a simple website and even a static web uh, website. Uh, but when uh, somebody has uh, filled all the form and said um, and hit send button, uh, all this information will be uh, pushed into a message bus. A message bus is uh, a basically a pipe that can accumulate a huge number of messages. Um, so you are not limited by the input throughput um, and you're, you can uh, output them um, as you can and uh, with the speed uh, you can have. Uh, so we can have one background process uh, that will uh, basically pump out 
messages one by one and then treat them and then write them to a specific database so we ensure that um, everybody can have actually a mask or not. Um, so th that's the kind of things you can do. Um, you will not use uh, this principle for all your application, uh, but if you have some specific hot paths uh, within your application or a specific feature uh, that you know will gain a lot of traction, uh, maybe you can use uh, one of these techniques um, to uh, actually be able to uh, uh, to scale much larger if you can relax time boundaries. And um, last principle um, is a uh, strive for uh, stateless services. So, um, Almost all applications need to manage a state in, in some form, um, and, and that's uh, totally understandable. The fact is uh, most of the um, uh, applications are, are really bounded by this state. Uh, for example, you cannot scale horizontally uh, easily if you need to manage a stage for uh, any user. Uh, because by doing so, you will need to reroute the same exact user to the same exact server at each request. Uh, so it could be complicated to scale if you need to uh, manage that kind of patterns. Um, and if, if we think about it, uh, there is a bunch of things we can do with the state. Uh, web developers tend to uh, store most of the state in memory or in a, in a, in a state manager. Uh, on the back end. But today, uh, with modern frameworks, uh, we have modern uh, programming languages, uh, we can do a bunch of things. Uh, for example, we can uh, push a part of the state onto the uh, client itself. Um, we can use the URIs, uh, we can use um, session cookies, uh, we can use um, the HTML5 uh, local storage API, or if you're uh, developing a desktop or a mobile application, you have plenty of storage uh, to uh, to use, so you can you can patch a lot of state um, into the in, into directly the client uh, application. Uh, you can use a specialized service, uh, for example, uh, Memcache or uh, Redis are uh, two systems that allows you to uh, put all this cache in memory, so you will have fast access. Uh, most of the time, uh, if this server is going down, you are losing all the data. So it, it should not be your only um, way to store the state, uh, but it, it can help you uh, to uh, to scale across a number of different servers. Um, and then we have uh, some specific patterns and specifically in the cloud environments uh, to allow you to uh, scale um, the state uh, much easier than, than before in the in distributed systems. And, and two of them are uh, the actual model uh, and the durable functions. So the actual model is a different way of programming services. Um, you can uh, look at this on our documentation or elsewhere on the web. And durable function is a um, very light implementation of the actor model on top of uh, one Azure services, the Azure functions. And if you want to um, see a concrete example of this, um, I encourage you to check out um, a small blog post I uh, wrote uh, last December about the durable actors, uh, where the idea was how I can um, um, actually compute a state of a physical machine just by having a few events, uh, like the machine is starting, the machine is stopping, and a bunch of other informations. Uh, so you can see how easy it could be to uh, um, implement uh, uh, an actor in a, in a durable functions. So, uh, that was all for the uh, main principles, um, and then uh, we can uh, go on to uh, the uh, recipes. Again, uh, please uh, send any question you can have in the Q&A. Uh, we have a slight delay uh, between me talking and you hearing what I just said. Uh, so uh, please uh, send your question along the way uh, so I can answer them um, um, during the presentation of, or just after. So let's go now to uh, some uh, recipes for scale.
so I have a bunch of different principles. Uh, all of them are in a single slide. Um, it's a bit dense, um, and if you have any other questions after this, uh, again, there is a Q&A or uh, join me on Twitter if you're uh, uh, watching the, the recording. So the first one um, is an easy one, but again, there is a lot of different applications that actually don't do it. Uh, it's move static content to a CDN. Uh, CDN means a content delivery network, which is basically um, a network, um, a worldwide network of servers that are optimized to serving static content. Static content could be uh, HTML, it could be uh, CSS or JavaScript files, it could be images, video, PDF, etc. A bunch of different uh, things. Uh, so um, moving content to the static CDN, uh, to moving static content, sorry, to the CDN uh, allows you to actually give more room for actual uh, bread and butter requests to your server. Uh, so uh, right now, for example, I'm building a new website. Um, I will uh, share it in a in a uh, in a few days in a uh, uh, in my Twitter account. Um, it, it's a single page application we built with uh, Razor, uh, which is a new framework uh, from from Microsoft. Uh, for doing web applications. So all my application is actually served from the CDN. So when you hit www.mywebsite.com, everything is served from CDN. And then I have an api.mywebsite.com uh, where my front end will communicate with my backend services. So even the home page uh, of this application is served from a, from a CDN. Um, also my, uh, my uh, current blog, uh, is is served uh, on a on a CDN. Uh, use uh, cache headers accordingly. Um, even if you have or you don't have a CDN, uh, you will have um, a cache um, within the client. Uh, so whenever you're uh, creating a web application, all the web browsers uh, will cache a number of things. Uh, for you, or if you're using, um, if you are creating a mobile application or a desktop application, you can implement uh, HTTP cache strategies as well. Uh, so again, if you're, if something is cached on on the client side, it's one request you don't have to actually um, uh, process. So it's more room uh, for you. Uh, take advantage of service workers and local storage on the client. Uh, there is a lot of um, advances um, in, in the HTML uh, and web development space. And now you can have access to a bunch of different things. You can uh, prefetch prefetch resources. So for example, if you know that uh, uh, somebody is hitting your web page and there is a likely chance that they go on to the second page and this second page needs a specific JavaScript file, you can actually int the web browser to say, hey, please, when you have done with rendering this web page, download these things because I will need them in a minute. Uh, and it will be more uh, more easier for the users. And 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 service workers uh, allows you to do a bunch of different things on the client side. Um, if I um, uh, get on the uh, social media image resizer sample, for example. Um, I, I told you that you can do this image resizing on a uh, background worker and, and communicating through a service bus with this background worker. But actually, most of the time, you can do it on the client side. Uh, so actually, you will not upload a full picture onto your server. You will already upload a resized image. Uh, some of the things uh, we don't think about, but a lot can be pushed onto the, onto the client. Um, next recipe is, is uh, cache aside patterns. Um, I will give you a link at the end of the uh, presentation where um, you will have a bunch of scalabilities uh, design patterns with even code sample, etc. Uh, the cache aside pattern is uh, basically trying to, uh, if you have a data store like a database, uh, which can be overloaded by requests, uh, and most of your requests are um, to read the same thing. Uh, for example, again, if you have a, an e-commerce website, uh, the uh, product list on your front page, uh, you can assume that it will not change uh, so often. 
so what you can do is to um, code a database once and then put it on a cache, put all these data on a cache, for example, Redis or Memcache, or depending on your web framework, um, using a, an in-memory um, cache um, service. Um, so the, all the subsequent requests will eat this cache and will not hit the real database. So you will saving a request onto your database and you will be able to uh, scale uh, much more. Um, uh, next one is uh, scale through uh, cloud services. Um, today, uh, there is a bunch of different options to host your application. And obviously, uh, if you're using uh, cloud services like Azure, you will have a bunch of different options to scale and, and you will be able to uh, scale more easily uh, that if you're in an on-premises um, system where you basically need to rack up a new server to set up it, etc. Uh, so definitely you can you can use cloud services to do this. And and if you're not on um, if you're already not on a cloud service provider, uh, that's totally okay. You can actually use some specific services. Um, for, for example, you can use the Azure CDN to save your static assets and keep your actual application where it's hosted now. Um, so you can mix and match um, non on premises uh, um, hosting and, and cloud services uh, to uh, start your scaling here. Yeah, it's, it's not an on and off. Uh, you, can, you can do uh, both things at the same time. Um, Evaluates uh, serverless for uh, scale sensitive services. So serverless is basically a new way of um, A, programming and B, deploying applications that allows you to uh, basically encapsulate a functionality to, into a code function and to push only this code function and to be built uh, only for the execution, actual execution of this code function. Uh, so you can do a, a, a pretty interesting, interesting things because much of the scaling issues are under by the serverless platform and not by uh, by, by your application or, or your services. And you can scale from one to million execution a day uh, without having uh, to worry much about a, a lot of things. Uh, so in Azure, we have Azure Function and Logic Apps were to big uh, serverless uh, offerings, uh, but there is a ton of different serverless offerings. And for example, if you're using Kubernetes, uh, you can do serverless within uh, Kubernetes too. So it's an interesting um, programming model, but it's also an interesting uh, deployment model. And again, uh, if you're not on the cloud, you can actually uh, use serverless to push to the cloud some of your services and not all of them. Um, uh, then um, number seven, do not use only one data store. Um, most of the application I encounter, most of the startup CTOs I talk with, um, they are picking one data store, uh, I don't know, MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, uh, MongoDB, etc. And they basically try to use any uh, bit of that and, and that's it. And in most of the cases, uh, you will get better results, uh, better efficiency if you're actually using different type of data source. Uh, you can use MySQL database plus a MongoDB database for specific things and even a file system or an Azure tablet storage for other part of the applications. So do mm -hmm. not hesitate to when you need to store a new data to understand what will be the access patterns and write patterns of, of this specific data, what would be the kind of scale this data could have and, and where this data should be stored. Uh, and maybe using your default data store um, is not the best um, option. Um, I see a bunch of questions uh, coming. Uh, uh, please send them. Um, I will uh, answer them in a, in a few minutes. Uh, number eight, uh, partition new data. Uh, so it's not an all in uh, recipes. You don't need to partition every single type of data you're handling, um, but sometimes uh, having a, a way to partition your data uh, could allow you uh, 
uh, from the beginning, even if you're storing everything in one table in one SQL database, that's OK. Uh, but if you already know how to partition your data, again, you will be able to split on different partitions, turn out, etc. cetera, um, um, later on. Uh, number nine, think about data denormalization and, and duplication. Um, and it's kind of related to uh, recipe number seven. Uh, do not use only uh, one data store. Um, most of the people say, hey, if I uh, store the list of my customer on this uh, SQL database, then it's a point of reference. I will not store them elsewhere. And that could be, um, um, that could end up um, having uh, issues uh, scaling with specific uh, type of data. If you have a data that is accessed very frequently, but uh, with a specific pattern or et cetera, uh, maybe you should store this data onto two different services, two different system, and maybe with not the same partitioning strategy, etc. Uh, because you will um, actually optimize for scaling for two different things. Uh, so yeah, it's something uh, sometimes, most of the time we say, no, do not duplicate the data onto your system because it's uh, creating a, a mess and you can have uh, differences between your, your data store, etc. But actually sometimes, uh, if you think about it, 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 it will be the best, uh, the best solution. And one of the biggest sample of us, um, and and it's linked to uh, recipe number one, um, is um, um, it was kind of a Craigslist website. So you can post, uh, hey, I want to sell this uh, this used product for ten bucks. Do you want to buy it? Uh, and what they actually done is they um, created an entire uh, static copy of. Uh, their websites and if they um, if the main infrastructure is going down all the users are automatically redirected to this static uh, website so they cannot do uh, they cannot contact the um, seller uh, for example they can send a message to the seller but they can browse uh, through all the catalog and everything is served from a CDN it is kind of an extreme a uh, way of duplicating uh, not only your data, but actually all your website and all the rendering of all the pages. Um, but actually it could be interesting in, in, in specific use cases. Um, number 10, uh, design for uh, rollback. Um, when I work in, a, in my previous setup, um, sometimes uh, we change a slight bit of code. Um, and everybody on the team is reviewing it uh, through a pull request, etc. And then everybody was happy and we push it onto production and we crash uh, the website because we didn't think about uh, the fact that the specific function is called uh, 10 times for each user request um, and it's a high pass uh function and we the slight modification we change uh actually uh, consume uh three percent more cpu on each call and you multiply by the number of user etc you actually uh, crash on the system uh so you need to be able to roll back um any code or any infrastructure changes uh you're putting on because even if you think about it even if you review it you may uh, actually uh, didn't understood that it will have huge consequences Number 11, uh, limit your blast radius uh, through throttling and feature flags. So the idea of the blast radius is basically understanding about um, any of your services. If they go down, uh, what is going down uh, within your application? Uh, sometimes if you push a specific modification, um, actually you will um, just impacts user who will try to export a year archived or their data. So basically it may be one user a day. So it's not a big deal. But if you're uh, doing something that will impact, if it's going down, that will impact the homepage of your website or, or your application, you will basically um, impact 100% of your users. Uh, so depending on your blast radius for any specific service or feature, um, actually, uh, you will need to take different uh, precautions uh, to um, actually um, proof uh, uh, proof saving this uh, this specific service. And and two of the techniques you can use 
are uh, throttling and, and feature flags. Throttling is basically the idea of um, putting a soft limit, a software limit onto a specific service. So let's say you uh, load tested uh, a specific uh, backend API and you know that your current server can handle um, 100 requests per second, then you will put um, a soft limit. So any requests more than 100 per second, the 101-ish uh, per second, um, we get blocked automatically. Uh, so you, you will not consume resources you don't actually have. Um, it could be complement, uh, uh, easy or, or very complicated to implement throttling depending on your APIs and language and framework, etc. Um, if it's complicated, you can still use um, service, an API gateway service like Azure API Management that we allows you to basically create a proxy between uh, who is calling your service and your actual service, and you can implement throttling uh, within this API gateway. And feature flags is uh, basically a way to turn on or off uh, specific features, or even depending on the feature flag system you're using, because you can just have a feature flag class um, with a bunch of properties and 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 having a Boolean result uh, on or off uh, that set, or you can have much more complicated feature flags uh, services. Uh, you can even, depending on your services, um, activate specific feature for a percentage of your users. Um, and then you can, when you deploy a new feature, when you roll out a new feature, you can roll out to only 10% of your user, and then 20, and then 50, and then 17, uh, up to 100%. Oh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, I actually uh, spoiled you uh, the last one already, uh, uh, which is uh, prepare a static read-only emergency version of your app. Uh, if uh, everything is going down uh, for any reasons, um, maybe you want to be able to have uh, maybe not the entire app in read-only fashion, but maybe uh, some of the services or your home page and uh, two or three important pages uh, already uh, pre-calculated and served as, as a static uh, read-only website. Um, at least your user will not have the full experience, but they will still be able to experience part of your product. Depending on your product, you will not be able to do this. Again, all these 12 recipes are uh, just here to uh, give you some ideas and you need to uh, uh, pick them if they are um, interesting for you. Um, so be re to be prepared for the next wave or of, of scaling, and I hope you will uh, uh, endure uh, such a such a wave. Uh, you need to know your trade off. Uh, you need to have also your monitoring ready uh, because if you're monitoring nothing, you will not know uh, if you will hit the wave or not. Um, and also you need to uh, learn from your failures. Uh, even if I worked on a very highly uh, scalable and distributed system, uh, sometimes I made mistakes because I don't have all the information or the um, the wave is coming uh, out of nowhere or we are not prepared on this specific project, etc. The important thing is uh, not to blame anybody, but try to understand what happened and what you can do uh, to fix the next wave. Um, so I will give you all the links um, uh, just in a minute uh, with all the slides. Um, but tr three links I think uh, could be interesting if you're if you want to learn more about this topic. Uh, first is the scalability checklist. Uh, so it's a bunch of things you may want to check out uh, within your current project to see if you have uh, a scalability ready. Uh, the other one is the cloud design patterns. So it's a bunch, as I said, a bunch of different patterns uh, and some of them with code samples. Uh, to be able to uh, scale. Um, it's definitely uh, useful if you're in a cloud fashion, and even if you're not hosting on the cloud, there is definitely uh, interesting things to uh, to check out. Uh, and the last thing, uh, it's a bit more technical, but um, there is a free ebook uh, uh, authored by the uh, co-creator of Kubernetes, uh, which is a designing distributed system, but also uh, contains a bunch of interesting uh, topics. Um, and with this in mind, um, we, you will be able after the presentation uh, to check out the slides on aka.ms slash chris slash slides 
And I will jump on uh, the uh, Q&A. I have already a bunch of questions. That's great. Uh, you can uh, send them uh, if you if you have more more of these uh, questions. So uh, first question uh, is how good is it to architect an application which is tightly bind to, with a specific cloud service? For example, uh, using MongoDB, Stitch, Trigger, and AWS, even Bridge to get the real-time notification from MongoDB side to AWS side. Basically a serverless style, but it's tightly bind to MongoDB, SaaS, and other US. So um, it's it's actually a great question, and a lot of people are kind of afraid of being too tight um, on a specific cloud service and then whatever uh, cloud provider you're using. Um, in, in your question, you're uh, uh, talking about other US, but the question is uh, relevant for any um, basically any cloud provider. Um, I would say that uh, first people are uh, most of the time afraid and I think of nothing uh, to be too tight on, on a cloud service. I can definitely understand it, um, but the fact is uh, very few projects are actually moved from one cloud to another. So uh, basically uh, maybe you're taking too much precautions for something that will not happen in the future. Um, second thing is, uh, if you're um, architecting an application right, you can actually encapsulate all the part of your application that will actually talk to um, a cloud-specific interface, cloud-specific API or SDK, uh, and so you will be able to move to another cloud provider much more easily. Uh, the basic as a sample of us as hey, uh, you want to talk to um, AWS S3 um, API, so you're, you will not call the S3 SDK right within your code. What you need to do is to create an interface in your programming language and to implement um, concrete class, and this concrete class uh, um, would be the only part of your application actually requiring and, and using and talking to the S3 SDK. So all the other part of your application which actually hit um, an interface and if you need to switch to Azure Storage, um, the same princip general principle applies and 98% of the time you will just need to actually record one class and be able to move from a service provider A to a service provider B. Uh, the other option uh, that could be interesting, I'm not a, a specialist of AWS, uh, I'm uh, much more in, a, in, in Azure, obviously, uh, but for example, in Azure, um, for a lot of our services, we have a, um, a Microsoft specific, Azure specific API, and some of our services also offer an open protocol API. For example, Cosmos DB, as I said, Cosmos DB is a, a highly scalable uh, cloud-ready database, uh, but actually Cosmos DB expose also a MongoDB API on top of the uh, Microsoft uh, SQL API. Uh, so actually you can use all most of the Cosmos DB features um, and using the, Cos the MongoDB API. Uh, so sometimes um, you can you can also do these things. Uh, if you are using a very very specific service that's only available on on a specific cloud, uh, yeah, maybe it's uh, the good way to think versus uh, you're investing a little uh, right now to get a, a great architecture, and yes, you're tied to a specific cloud provider, and in the future, if the service uh, is still useful, etc., and if you want to move out then you can think about re-architecting this specific part of the application. But as long as you're decoupling uh, all your dependency onto specific SDKs and, and, and decoupling your services between them, you will be able to move from one cloud to another uh, much more easily. So our next question from Hans, um, about CDN and front-end application, uh, when do I use AngularJS or ReactJS to develop my application? We, I will put my static content into CDN and object storage, but this front-end application uses Node.js to run. Do I need a machine, maybe serverless Azure function to run this code? So yeah, um, so the 
uh, front-end application space is moving quite quickly, and I think what you're referring to is uh, basically a single-page application, but uh, with a server-side rendering. Uh, so this is uh, uh, pretty interesting uh, for, uh, for example, SEO, uh, search engines, uh, engines, engines, sorry, uh, because um, if everything is rendered uh, through a single uh, HTTP website, uh, HTTP JavaScript application, uh, all the SEO will not be able to uh, see it. Uh, so if your, uh, if your question is about this specific case, then um, you can actually um, ask the CDN um, to get its source not from the um, uh, static object storage, but from an actual application that can run maybe on an OGS uh, um, Azure functions or uh, maybe on an, an OGS uh, Azure app service, Azure web app. Um, so that's the first uh, thing. Um, if your question was more about, I have a, a fully single page application, Angular GS or React GS, and this application need to talk to specific APIs on the backend, and I wrote these APIs uh, uh, to run on top of the Node.js framework, then absolutely uh, you can use Node.js to uh, build um, APIs um, on Azure Functions, and this um, your website will be able to uh, talk to uh, these uh, Azure Function hosted APIs. Um, next question. Uh, from Chris. Actually, Chris, you have two questions. Uh, the first one is easy. Is Throttling a different name for rate limiting? Absolutely. Uh, it's uh, exactly the same thing. Um, and your uh, second question is, would you start with infrastructure as code from the very beginning of the project? What is your approach? Uh, so if you don't know what is infrastructure as code is, uh, basically, instead of going, uh, for example, onto the um, control panel uh, of your cloud provider uh, on the Azure portal and, and right click uh, to create um, all the components of your infrastructure, you will actually write some uh, code. Uh, most of the time is uh, in a JSON or YAML kind of file. And then you will use uh, some capabilities of either, either the cloud provider or uh, open source products like uh, Terraform uh, to actually build up the infrastructure. Um, so what's, what's your approach? So um, my approach will be uh, different depending on if I'm the only one to work on the project or, and it's like, and most of the time it's like a pet project, it's not a real thing or I, am I working on a, on a real project? If I'm working on a real project, I definitely um, start with infrastructure as code from the beginning, um, but I allow some flexibilities. Uh, let's say, for example, I can have ARM templates uh, for Azure. I, I can have uh, ARM templates, but also a bit of PowerShell or maybe two or three steps that are manual. Uh, because it's complicated to uh, to get them into a bash script or Porsche script. Uh, but having most of the components uh, directly from, from infrastructure as code. Uh, when I'm doing a personal project, what I tend to do is to uh, create all the resources through uh, CLI. But uh, when I've done this, um, I go over, uh, again, it's very um, Azure specific. I go over to my resource group and I actually download um, all the uh, templates. Uh, when you're using the Azure portal to create a resource, um, it's uh, behind the scenes creating an ARM template and you can actually download this template. It's not perfect, uh, but actually you can use it to uh, recreate your uh, resources later on. Uh, so I, I just save them and it's not, I, I don't have any pipeline to actually um, do all the infrastructure as code work, etc. But at least um, I have um, everything on a um, on my on my system and I can then use them to actually build the proper infrastructure as code uh, script and uh, infrastructure. Um, so we run it out of time and I think there is no uh, new question or there is uh, no, there is no new question. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, adding. I will just um, 
give you the slide your URI, uh, http slash aka.ms slash chris slash slides, and I will upload the slides uh, just after the call. And again, if you have um, any other question, uh, please uh, reach out to me um, on, on, on on Twitter or on LinkedIn. But if you're on LinkedIn, please uh, uh, say that you attend to uh, this uh, Microsoft Reactor uh, event. Um, well, um, I wish you a, a good day. I hope you learn uh, interesting things and I hope to uh, see you again in uh, the next Reactor events. Thank you.